I'll see what I can do. And do you plan on finishing the story this time, young man? As Joseph Campbell explained, we need stories to instill the individual a sense of awe and beauty at the magnitude, wonder and plurality of the universe. And throughout different cultures and societies, the story about children becoming adults is a pretty prominent cultural thread. Despite being set in feudal Japan, following themes of memory, spirituality, family, and life and death, Kubel is able to contain the magnitude of its wide collections of concepts under a very familiar tale that we all know. The Hero's Journey. Joseph Campbell has dismantled this into 17 stages divided into three sections, departure, initiation, and return. And for the purpose of this essay, I will just stick to one stage per section because the goal of this essay is to explore the thematic impact of memory on identity. So I don't want to get too distracted, okay? And I've also already done a whole video about it before, so... You didn't even know you had them five minutes ago. It's important to understand that memory is something that grounds us. It provides a continuity that allows our sense of self to know where you are, where you were, and therefore where you're going. And this is often a social process, something we do with other people. In Kubo, memory is a reward, and remembering is the struggle. We watch him go from telling unfinished stories to an audience enthralled to going off on a journey into a world dangerously threatening, but in his mind, exciting. You're growing stronger. You might not want to look quite so pleased about that. We grow stronger, the world grows more dangerous. And one of the most important stages during this act of the story is the introduction of the supernatural aid. We need to go now. As Campbell described, for those who have not refused to call, the first encounter of the hero journey is with a protective figure, often a low crone or old man, who provides the adventurer with amulets against the dragon forces he's about to pass. For Kubo, this comes in the form of Monkey, who had previously existed as a doll in his bag. You don't recognize me. All these years, you had to keep me in your pack. Well, now you know why. And immediately, it's symbolically subversive, because the wise wizard figure who not only acts as a guide, but as a conduit into the new frontier isn't a wise old man, but is a motherly animal. This isn't about a character and their relationship with a geographical setting. The stage is instead based in his mind, his sense of identification with what is, what isn't, and what can be. Kubo doesn't refuse to call to adventure, instead his internal obstacles come from the inability to engage with the present maturely or meaningfully. He collides a bit with Monkey, not knowing that she is in fact his mother, even though it's pretty obvious. Kubo's childlike immaturity comes from his inability to see the subtext of his own life. And then we have another aide, with Beetle, who provides an oppositional perspective to Monkey, because like Kubo, he sees everything more obviously because of a sense of preoccupation with the material over the mnemonics or spiritual. Impressive. But as the fishing scene would show, the lack of nuance is what makes the characters short-sighted and questionable in terms of effectiveness. Not bad. And what's your plan for getting the fish into the boat so we can actually eat it? But both Monkey and Beetle are there for him, regardless, cleaning up after his mistakes. They're the safety net that protects him from his consequences. It's really quite obvious that Monkey and Beetle are the reincarnated versions of Kubo's parents. They argue like an old married couple, each have very powerful influences over Kubo's development. Of course not. We're having a grown-up conversation. You're going to fight again. Kubo, just go over there and play with something. And they each reflect different halves of Kubo's identity, a hero of great bravery and moral simplicity, and someone who is vulnerable but more assured with dealing with more complicated matters. 
But like Kubo who is a simple kid that's good hearted, these differences don't collide. They fit together with quite comfortable harmony. And this is present in the Roads of Trials stage, which is when the ordeal is a deepening of the problem of the first threshold and question is still in balance. Can the go put itself to death? For a many headed is the surrounding hydra, one head cut off, two more appear unless the right caustic applied to the mutilated stump. Oh man, my reading abilities are so bad. Ugh. The first trial is the fight with the big skeleton in order to retrieve the sword unbreakable. And it's from the pressure from the situation that trust and cooperation manifests itself with Kubo, Beetle and Monkey. They become one moral unit more or less. And then the second trial is the boat fight. Kubo and Beetle go off to retrieve the breastplate impenetrable while Monkey fights with her sister. This is also the encounter where Kubo finally discovers Monkey is his mother. In both set pieces, the reward for fighting isn't actually the armor pieces, but is the social bonds, discoveries based on remembering. My son. There's a theorist called Maurice Holbrax who made a point that we don't ever really remember alone, but we remember as social actors in relations to social structures and groups. This is me paraphrasing, but the structure and group that persists in the story is with the unit of family. Shared memory is what brings the characters closer together, but it's also what tears them apart. This is punctuated by the final trial. Both Monkey and Beetle die fighting with the sisters. The shadow from the past consumes the both of them in the present. Memories of betrayal, love and obsession is what the antagonists are motivated by, and it offers a competing mnemonic narrative to the one that Monkey and Beetle represents. Their love was a betrayal for them. Like the duality within Kubo's individual identity that is in the form of his parents, there's also an ethical duality that exists within the world of social remembering and the world he lives in. Consequently, now Kubo has to defeat the Moon King, aka his grandfather, by becoming a master of two worlds, which Joseph Campbell nicely defined as his personal ambitions being totally dissolved. He no longer tries to live, but willingly relaxes to whatever may come to pass in him. He becomes, that is to say, in anonymity. The laws live in him with his unreserved consent. I'm pretty sure I used this quote before at one point. And this is encapsulated by Kubo's willingness to accept that fighting the Moon King even with all his armor won't be enough. This is not a physical conflict, this is a subtextual one where he has to reconcile with the dualities that motivate the world around him. And this comes in the form of speaking his truth, competing with his adversaries through a different narrative. I know why you want my eye. Because without it, I can't look into the eyes of another and see their soul. Their love. Everything you loved is gone. Everything you knew has been taken from you! No! It's in my memories! The most powerful kind of magic there is. Moon King wants Kubo's other eye to become immortal. Ironically, he's blinded by this narrow desire because just in the name of his own future, he can't see his own mnemonic identity. So Kubo beats him by telling him a story that forces him to look at himself finally. Re-examining the short and despite his great powers, ultimately pathetic temporal horizon, Kubo does this by summoning the ghost of the village's lost ones using his instrument tied back together with his mother's hair, his father's bow, string and, well, his own hair too. The symbolism is pretty in your face, but it matches with the theme and the spirit of the story. Which is one eye can see more, if it can remember more, if it can love more. And this connection is an edifice, something that is made with the memories that we choose to compose our identity with. We are a story, and what makes a story isn't from how many eyes it looks out of, but from what motivates it. So when the Moon King is defeated and turns into a mortal man with no memories, this understanding is upheld by the villagers who provide him a new identity. One made of love, and this love answers who he was, who he is, and who he can be. You always lend a helping hand. You're a great example. Yes, absolutely. Oh, it turns out I'm pretty selfless. That's why we love you. 
And that's the power of memory in relations to identity. Stories teaches people how to live a model life despite circumstances in the form of morality and order. And I think Kubo and the Two Strings shows us that remembering as an act performed with family can be the most powerful act to embrace, because it changes the very reality we step foot on. All because of the sheer power of love. It's a bit corny, but I think that's why it's so poignant. <laughs> 